about uh, the relation between hyperbolic volume and quantum invariance. So it is a good occasion to recall the uh, things about volume conjectures and uh, related topics. So, uh, and, uh, so I'm very uh, pleased to get together with so many people. And uh, I want to reveal its relation to also other areas, to physics and uh, number theories and uh, some other things. So, okay. Okay. So, uh, so uh, in this morning session, uh, uh, I would like to ask the chairman to talk to you about the two But Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to introduce the first speaker of this uh, conference. Uh, the speaker is Professor Kropakov from the University of Toronto. And the title of his, title of his talk is Around Volumes and Boxetta Polytops, Caesar's Congress, and Related Conjectures. So please start. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me here uh, to Waseda University, where uh, I have been uh, a few times and always enjoyed my stays at Waseda working with colleagues here. Um, thank you very much. So uh, my talk uh, will essentially consist of two parts. The first part will be devoted to, to the hyperbolic world and uh, this part is based uh, largely on my recent work with uh, Mr. Rakami. And uh, the second part will uh, be related to the spherical world and uh, it is based uh, again in its main part on my recent work with uh, Professor Robbins um, who is now in Brazil he used to be uh, one of the directors of ICER at Brown University and moved to Brazil uh, so let me start I will give a, a short outline Basically, the first part is devoted to a classical problem. And the problem is computing volumes of polytubes in the hyperbolic free space. And in general, we know that finding a volume formula for a polytube, uh, which we suppose to be compact or finite volume for sure, um, in my talk, all polytubes will be assumed to be simple not compact, it's still simple, which means that every vertex has balance three, three edges, medium to vertex. And in general, this problem is complicated. A nice formulae are known mainly for tetrahedra. Uh, uh, also, the uh, formulas for Lambert cubes and prisms and octahedra of special kinds, and uh, some other polytopes uh, with special symmetries and uh, some particular cases but in general if you're handed a big complicated combinatorially complicated hyperbolic polytope and computing its volume becomes hard even numerically uh, well main tool in computing volumes is Schlafly's formula and it becomes very useful because uh, it relates the variation of volume with the variation of the angles, the hydral angles of the polytube. But also, it involves the edge length. And uh, as soon as a polytope is sufficiently complex, the geometry and combinatorics of this polytope affects the right-hand side of this formula and bas basically makes it uh, very complicated. So, solving this differential identity becomes very hard in general. Uh, we shall try to, uh, to find some other approach. And the approach roughly will be to reduce a given polyhedron to a number of tetrahedra and then add up their volumes. And for tetrahedra we have some plausible formula we can use. So we can hope that this representation for the volume of our polytope will be somewhat simple, or well, if not simple, then somehow 
uh, amenable to analysis, theoretical or numerical. There are several steps, several questions that we have to address before this uh, rough scheme becomes animated in any way. So first, how do we reduce our polytope to number of tetrahedra? Um, second question is uh, a bit funny. What actually a tetrahedron is? Can we reduce to just, just usual tetrahedra? Or we have to reduce to some more general objects, somewhat related to tetrahedra, um, but not quite usual tetrahedra in usual sense. With four vertices and six edges and four sides. Um, and uh, two other questions are more practical. So, first of all, do we have a suitable volume formulas? And uh, does this approach always work? Um, we shall reduce our polyhedron by applying a sequence of so called IH or whitehead moves, which are illustrated here. So, numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 mark the corresponding faces of the polytope. So, you see how the combinatorics changes. So, either 2, 4 are adjacent along an edge. And now, 1 and 3 become adjacent along an edge. And the, another move is a capping move. So a triangular face disappears, or we can introduce a triangular face. So you can think of it as, as adding a small cap, a small tetrahedron on top here. So its top vertex will exactly become this, this vertex here. This second dot. Um, or you may think of it as shrinking a triangular face into a vertex combinatorially. So now I want to, to, to present an example. And it's an example of a pleated prism. It's a pentagonal prism, one of whose side faces is pleated. Um, it's actually split into two. And here, we use a sequence of moves, IH and capping moves. Um, not quite sure if, if this picture is, uh, is blurred or not. <coughs> to me, it seems a bit blurred. Uh, sorry for the quality. Um, so, here we may see how, for example, the edge between faces 1 and 2 becomes the edge between faces 6 and 7, the outer face. This is the first IH move. Uh, then we cap off faces 1 and 2 to triangular faces. Then we do an IH move again. Then we cap two faces again and we get a tetrahedron. So what can we, what can we deduce from this small uh, mental experiment? Well, we, we can deduce that maybe, maybe, uh, every polytope, every polyhedron can be reduced to tetrahedron by a sequence of such moves. And uh, any simple... Uh, yes? Well, first your pictures of reduction look two-dimensional. The pictures of reduction that you showed, the IH and the other, are two-dimensional. So you seem to be moving around the boundary, but I, I don't quite understand what you're doing by the volume. Oh, where's the volume? Well, now... So you can change one shape to something completely different, but you the same volume. Uh, they uh, don't have the same volume. It's, it's purely combinatorial picture. It's purely combinatorial picture, so it, it, it's, it's been two-dimensional, and it remains two-dimensional. So now I reduce just the graph. I was about to say, for now, I reduce this traveling graph to a tetrahedron. And, and then I will devise some geometric process following these combinatorial moves. Okay, so this that, isn't yet the final this, picture. Yeah, no, 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 this is, this, this is just so a... you should think of this as a two-dimensional Yes, yes, you, you, or you can think of it as, a, as a playing with, a, with the associated graph, the skeleton of your polytope. And basically, you reduce the skeleton to something, to a tetrahedron. Um, but then, 
each step here, each each, uh, each h move, each cap and move, will be given some geometric sense, and there will be a decomposition of the initial polytope three-dimensional body into generalized tetrahedra that will follow these steps. And these steps, for now, are purely combinatorial, and any simple polyhedron can be reduced as a graph uh, to a tetrahedron, as a graph, by a sequence of uh, IH and capping, or capping moves. So now, we just suggested uh, ad hoc so, some method of simplifying a polyhedron combinatorially. But what we need is indeed a way of simplifying it geometrically. So for now, I want to introduce a geometric notion that will be one of the central notions we use, that of a generalized tetrahedron. So, well, let me draw a usual tetrahedron. This is a usual tetrahedron. And it can live in the hyperbolic space under some conditions. We can imagine that some of the vertices are either compact or ideal, or even ultra-ideal, which means there are polar hyperplanes chopping them off. So if there are any polar hyperplanes present, this is a generalized tetrahedron. Thing is that when some vertices get truncated, it may or may not happen that the truncated hyperplanes, the polar hyperplanes, intersect. Sometimes they do intersect. So here we actually have a new figure. Which doesn't look like a normal standard tetrahedron that we are used to. So the figure is, is here, where two truncating polar hyperplanes intersect. So I will redraw this figure. Um, What we got looks more like a prism, and it is indeed a prism. And here we have an additional edge that comes from two polar hyperplanes that intersect. So this object is also generalized tetrahedron and it can be described by the four initial normal vectors to the, to the supporting planes of the initial white standard tetrahedron. And the thing is, some of these planes are now ultra parallel. They don't intersect, they don't they don't become tangent at infinity, they are ultra parallel. And thus we have to add some polar hyperplanes. So 
here, if we have ultra ideal vertices, we associate with them planes. And then what we do, we draw the intersection of the planes defined by normal vectors and the planes defined by ultra ideal vertices. So here at the end we have one, two, three place planes, one, two, three faces, three faces that are defined by the initial normal vectors. And um, we have two faces that are defined by ultra ideal vertices. And the intersection of the respective half spaces is some geometric figure that we call a generalized tetrahedron. I will show some examples of generalized tetrahedra. And each time there will be an initial tetrahedron present, just the usual standard tetrahedron, some of whose vertices will be chopped off by polar hyperplanes, and you will see how these polar hyperplanes intersect, in which combinations. Um, I don't think that the, the list I give is exhaustive, it's just a list of uh, um, generalized tetrahedra that basically we've used in our computations. And uh, here is a volume formula due to Murakami and Yano that can be modified uh, in the case of generalized tetrahedron and uh, together with each picture of, uh, of each type of generalized tetrahedron that I will present, uh, will be coming a corresponding volume formula in which there will be functions u and v as displayed here. So, this is exactly the generalized tetrahedron I drew before. This is a so-called prism truncated tetrahedron. And here is a volume formula. So the new edge that came out of uh, the fact that two polar hyperplanes intersect is marked 4. And here is a parameter A4, which is just the exponent of minus the length of that edge, the parameter that comes into the evolving formula, and here is a term, a correction term, that gives us um, a formula, the evolving formula for this particular type of uh, generalized tetrahedron. Uh, excuse me, yes? by literal faces you mean the uh, arrow and blue face? Yes, yes, yes. So the, the yellow and blue faces actually intersect here. So this one is yellow, <coughs> this one is blue, and they intersect along edge 4. What do you mean parallel? Ultra parallel? Ultra parallel. So, um, this, this, this two faces won't be ultra parallel. Uh, uh, but uh, these two faces here will be ultra parallel. They, 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 they won't intersect at all. So here you have like an open funnel of infinite volume. And when you add these two new faces, you cut this funnel and you, you obtain a finite volume figure in this way. So, you may have two pairs of ultra parallel faces in the original tetrahedron, 
which means you will have to to bound two infinite funnels with two pairs for each of polar hyperplanes. So here, new edges one and four arise <coughs> at the intersection of new pairs of uh, polar hyperplanes that intersect each other um, and give rise to a finite volume figure. And the volume formula is modified like this. So for every new edge coming from a truncation, we basically introduce a correction term to the initial volume function V, which is present here. Excuse me. Yes? Why have you marked only some of the edges and actually six of them? Uh -huh. this big, in, in the previous picture, which is easier. I think I marked uh, the edges of the initial tetrahedron, which are six, but not the edges, not all the edges of um, the generalized tetrahedron that comes out of it. Yes, uh, yes. So here, basically, the new edge lies uh, across to the initial edge one. Here the new edge lies across to the initial edge four. So, so does that mean the new edge, both endpoints are interior of the faces? You have to require that. Uh, both end, endpoints of the new edge must be right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is it yeah, right, right. Uh, so the, the new edge, uh, yes, yeah, so the, the leftmost and the rightmost points of this new edge uh, do belong to the leftmost and rightmost faces, yes, yes. It's a closed figure. Uh, so there could be another configuration. If you have two pairs of ultra parallel faces in the initial tetrahedron, um, and there are some more examples. So in each case, we can introduce some correction term that we add up to the initial volume function, and thus we express the volume of this new uh, generalized tetrahedron. And each time the parameter a here is no more, the exponent of the dihedral angle as in the initial formula, but if a k corresponds to a new edge of length L, k, we set a k to be the exponent of minus the length of L k. Or you can think of it as the angle gets replaced by the imaginary length of some edge that is outside. No, it's not outside of the hyperbolic space, it's actually inside. This analogy is kind of vague, but it's convenient to think of it this way. There are various configurations, so you can see how much a generalized tetrahedron is thick in shape here can be different from, from a usual tetrahedron, combinatorial. But it still can be described just, just by four normal vectors in principle. Okay. So now let us play more with the pleated prism. Let us take pleated prism depicted here. So there are some integers associated with edges. If there is an edge labeled N, it means that the hydral angle along the edge is pi over N. And here 
we see some decomposition of the splitted prism into into seven tetrahedra generalized tetrahedra for example tetrahedra one two and three are prism truncated and this tetrahedron here inside T4 is exactly this type when you have uh, two pairs of ultra parallel faces. So it has two new edges introduced into it. And these thick edges here mark P67 and P35 are the uh, the common perpendiculars to the faces 6, 7 and 3, 5 in the initial picture that I showed you, the combinatorial picture <coughs> so this picture now corresponds to a geometric realization and, as you remember, the first move we, we did was a move on this edge here. It was an IH move. And what we want to say now, we want to say now that this IH move corresponds to splitting of a generalized tetrahedron T2. And capping the remaining triangular faces corresponds to splitting of the generalized tetrahedra T1 and T3. So and so on. If the way to split B is unique, I mean, do you have some algorithm to. Uh, Just yeah, so first you apply a sequence of moves. And then, every time you apply a move, what you actually have to define a move uh, are four planes. In each move, you have four planes. And you have certain normal vectors, if you realize your figure geometrically. And these four vectors define a generalized tetrahedron. And this is exactly the tetrahedron that we want to split off. So, a sequence of IH moves splits off and then capping moves splits off first T2, then T1, T3, and it splits off T6, and then capping moves split off T5 and T7, and we are left with T4. So, in the combinatorial picture, when we realize this figure geometrically, and we make moves, so uh, this move here, the first IH move, involves faces 1, 2, 6 and 7. So the generalized tetrahedron determined by the normals to the faces 1, 2, 6 and 7 is split off. And this is the tetrahedron T2. And then we do two capping moves. And the planes involved are planes 2, 6, 3, 7, and 6, 1, 5, 7. And this corresponds, this, this sequence of moves corresponds to splitting of tetrahedra T2 and T3. So every time you make a move, a combinatorial move, geometrically, you have four planes and some associated uh, 
some associated generalized tetrahedron. This tetrahedron comes out. So as the sequence of move progresses, um, these moves reduce your combinatorial picture to a tetrahedron. And there is an associated geometric process that splits off generalized tetrahedra from some geometric realization of your quality. However, um, if we have a combinatorial polytope, it may have many geometric realizations with different dihedral angles. So the question is, um, will the geometric splitting of all geometric realizations of a given combinatorial object follow um, one is follow faithfully the combinatorial reduction process. So will we realize this combinatorial reduction process geometrically every time? Or maybe it won't realize geometrically, maybe something will happen. So definitely we'll make some assumptions if we think that this process is realized geometrically. So we, we need to come up with particulars of any pair of faces to two lines side P and uh, in this case P has a geometric decomposition into generalized tetrahedra but this constituent tetrahedra can in principle overlap or a geometric realization can become ugly can become this butterfly type and uh, if the constituent parts overlap we need some kind of inclusion-exclusion formula and uh, in the butterfly case actually the usual formula works it's some kind of analytic continuation phenomenon it, it, it works for tetrahedra that, that are butterfly in this sense when the half spaces intersect so badly that you have a figure which is non-convex um, but in these cases things become tricky so, once we have a very good uh, decomposition, so that there are no overlaps, no butterflies, then we can state a theorem. This theorem is basically a theorem with uh, quotation marks. It's not an honest to good theorem, uh, because it assumes quite, quite a bit. And if all the assumptions hold, then we can compute the volume of our polytope through solving basically some system of equations. And this system of equations turns out to be a system of uh, algebraic equations in the variables AKL. And each monomial in that system has degree no bigger than 4. So this system can be solved uh, pretty accurately and pretty efficiently by a computer. And in many cases, especially if we work with Coxeter polytopes, even complicated Coxeter polytopes, uh, such a decomposition exists. And the system of equations has a unique solution. But sometimes, if uh, overlaps happen, or butterfly and tetrahedra come out, in the process, we have several solutions. But it's an experimental observation that actually one of these solutions delivers the volume. So our theorem allows us to compute the volume of this pleated prism. And the volume is here. Here is the length of the common perpendicular. Well, combinatorial moves that I, I presented you with uh, basically correspond to some well-known moves that are used when computing the Karelov Rishitikin invariant. And uh, I believe if you, if you have an annotated planar 
travel and graph, then this is, this is exactly the pair of moves you use. You don't have to unmod arcs. So, regarding these similarities of our splitting algorithm and skin relation for the Kirillov Rashitikin invariant, uh, we have a conjecture that can be regarded as a volume conjecture for polytopes and actually an invariant, uh, a variant, sorry, a variant of zero. So, here is a statement of the conjecture. Um, there are some things in this statement that are a bit fishy, namely, um, we assume it, 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 it's nowhere said in the statement. We definitely uh, specify invariant at this root of unity here. And also, if, if we work with colorings, we want admissible colorings. So, because we do not really verify whether the coloring is admissible, we may need to, to replace Kirill of Rashitikin invariant with its uh, with, with the evaluation as defined by Costantino, Garito, and Fondale. And uh, then we can make some numeric experiments. This is basically due to Jun Murakami, this numeric experiment where the values of Kirillov Rashitikin invariant were computed, and the limiting value in the case of the uh, prism seems to be very close to its actual hyperbolic volume. I believe uh, we've done a few experiments of this type for prisms, splitted prisms, some dodecahedra. We tried a, a few examples of some what complicated, quite complicated hyperbolic polytopes and our volume, uh, our method for computing volumes gave us some answer, some volume of all these polytopes in all the cases and the limit of the Kirill of Rashitikin invariant computed numerically also gave us the values which were close to the volumes computed with our method and uh, we also backed up our computations where possible with the help of orb. So if you have a three-dimensional polytope and you double it you get an orb default whose volume you can compute with software called orb. For sure, you need to, to have uh, uh, or before then goes. Yeah. So, for example, if you double the Coxeter polytope, you can back up your computation by using all. So, this is a hyperbolic part. And uh, now the spherical part comes in. So, in a spherical space, volumes are also well studied. And I should say that the uh, spherical volumes uh, had been studied before hyperbolic volumes uh, became into sign. So, uh, yes, they had been studied be before hyperbolic volumes came into sign. Um, also, Ludwig Schlafly studied quite a bit of uh, spherical volumes and hyperbolic ones. and. Uh, there is a conjecture uh, initiated by Schlafly and revived by Chitge and Simons, which is called the rational simplex conjecture. This is one of the things I want to speak about in, in the spherical world, and uh, the conjecture is here. It says that if you have a tetrahedron whose angles are rational multiples of pi, or let's say for short, the angles are rational. Uh, then the volume of the tetrahedron 
is a rational multiple of pi square or let's say for short the volume is rational why a rational multiple of pi square well because it's three sphere and it's a natural metric of, of positive sectional curvature plus one has volume two pi square uh, there are positive examples for this conjecture basically some examples that they can make you think this, this conjecture holds because uh, if you consider finite coxeter groups those acting on sphere by reflections they are all they're all generated by reflections in the faces of some various um, coxeter the trahedra with rational angles of the fourth pi of n and their volumes the co-volumes of these groups the volumes of the coxeter tetrahedra are definitely integers of multiples of 2 pi square which is divide the volume of the sphere by the order of the group and um, with Sina Robins we produce some more examples corroborating this rational simplex conjecture uh, and the object we use is a Z2 symmetric tetrahedron so before in the hyperbolic world we used generalized tetrahedra and here we use tetrahedra with some symmetries tetrahedra very abundant and very rich objects so Z2 symmetry here means there is an axis passing through the midpoints of the edges labeled A and D and if you make a 180 degrees rotation around that axis the tetrahedron gets superimposed onto itself uh, here is a fact which follows from work of uh, Alexander Mednik, uh, Marina Pashkevich and me and the fact is that if XYZ are the tetrahedral angles of some symmet or Z Z2 symmetric spherical tetrahedron um, which satisfy this trigonometric identity then the volume of the tetrahedron can be expressed as a polynomial in the dihedral angles which usually doesn't happen the usual volume formula is very ugly you have to use some combinations of their logarithms or some integral or some integral presentations for the volume function so it's a uh, it's surprising that even for non coxeter tetrahedra you can actually devise some simple volume formula and an analogous statement holds for edge lengths so there exists a Z2 symmetric tetrahedron with this set of angles and this set of edge lengths so this tetrahedron has rational angles oh yes the conjecture no the fact Oh, the fact. The formula. Yes, here is the formula. So, with Sinai, by, by looking at these equations and basically interpreting them as equations, uh, some cyclotomic fields, we were able to, to find uh, lots of solutions that correspond to the case when x, y, z, t are rational multiples of pi of the form p over q times pi with q big number usually prime so can you describe the general solution? no I mean, it's a pure number theory property of well, this, this is what I told Sinai, and he told me, try it, I cannot do that. <laughs> but we, we, we did not give up, we, we are working on that. We really want to describe all these, because, in fact, 
if if you if you assume that a is equal to d, so the tetrahedron is, is not z uh, two symmetric; it has like three axes of symmetry. Uh, then this becomes cosine a equals cosine b times cosine c, the Pythagorean theorem on the sphere for the link of each vertex. So it's kind of Pythagorean triple or a generalized Pythagorean triple on uh, in, in the spherical geometry. Uh, the edge lengths are not familiar objects, but rational numbers are familiar objects. Oh. Please, the form the version with the angles. You want the angles to be rational. Yes, yes. So the other seems much more convenient for that's the Yeah, oh, yes, no. Sasha, if, if you have your, your four edges there, satisfying that, that the, the angle satisfying that equation on the board, then there's a, there's a bound for the normal edge of Q. You can't have solutions unless you have some accidental solutions where lots of the angles are. Sorry? So you have this equation on the board with x, y, and z, and t, q rational multiples of pi, you want a big denominator. Yes. Well, then, then you're going to have to have lots of the angles being the same. Oh, yes. You you, I mean, the, the general solution is only going to be finitely many. Uh, yeah, so, does it satisfy that equation? Well, I, 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 I don't know how, how many solutions actually come out, but uh, it seems if uh, the, the, the denominator grows, you have more and more solutions, so some of them repeat, some of them repeat. I don't talk about that. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so we found a rational tetrahedron with, with rational volume, which is not coxeter, and we can actually produce more examples of this type. And even more. We can produce two spherical tetrahedra, T1 and T2, both Z2 symmetric, with T2, or oh, sorry, with T1 being what we had before, and T2 having some some new set of the hydral angles. Okay. And the following facts hold true for T1 and T2. So T1 is not decomposable into any combination of coxeter tetrahedra. And T2 is a coxeter tetrahedron. Uh, T1, T2 are both rational tetrahedra, so their dense invariant is zero. T1 and T2 have equal volumes. So for the coxeter tetrahedron, there is a classical formula. For T1, which is very far from being coxeter, we can use our formula from the fact, and uh, what uh, what we are now thinking about is the following. We have two spherical tetrahedra. They have same volumes, and their dense invariant dense invariants are equal, actually equal to zero. Are these tetrahedra cases congruent or not? Um, I, sh I should recall that uh, the third Hilbert problem is settled in the Euclidean space, dimension 2, 3, and 4, and in the spherical and hyperbolic space in dimension 2. And in dimension 3, we, 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 we don't really know if uh, the pair volume then invariant determines this is congruence class or not. So we basically have uh, two tetrahedra in between which uh, the this is congruence is, is not obvious and it, it seems to <coughs> be very hard to, to find it if, if it exists at all. Or maybe Maybe they are not this is congruent, but I cannot prove either of the statements. So. Sorry, maybe I missed the definition. A coxeter tetrahedron means tetrahedral having coxeter group action. Uh, yes, a coxeter polytope 
means in general that pole A to whose dihedral angles are of the form pi or n. So if you have a coxeted tetrahedron in S3, then a group generated by reflections in its faces is exactly a coxeted, a finite coxeted group. What do you mean by combination? Combination, I mean uh, that you cannot cut T1 mm -hmm. into any number of coxeted tetrahedra. Mm -hmm. So you have several types of coxeted tetrahedra in S3, so T1 cannot be glued out of them. Uh, do you allow the, the sine sum or just the sum? Uh, just sum. Just sum, okay. So it's, it's not uh, really coxeta. Oh, sorry, it's not really cis congruence, it's a, more like a, a quid decomposability. So each type of coxeta group appears? Here, mm, no, 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 just this one, the product appears. Well, if, I mean, uh, if, if we will look more into the solutions and uh, into which tetrahedra we can get, which are rational with, with rational volume, not coxeter, uh, maybe we can find some of them whose, uh, whose volumes are equal to volumes of, of other types of coxeted tetrahedra, yes. Uh, but for now, we are basically stuck at this question. Are T1 and T2 cis congruent or not? Um, yeah, so I believe this is where I have to thank you for your attention and for questions and comments. Is there any question or comments? Yes. Well, yes. Maybe it's still on the this kind of Diophantine equation. If your numbers x, y, z, and t all have some denominator n, by pi for n, the problems of two cosines. Because two is the sum of two cosines, as yeah. we learned in school. So you have a sum of four cosines, which means you have a sum of four of eight powers of z, where z is an n through the unit. Yes. Four of them are some powers, and the other four are the conjugates to make four cosines. So then you would have to have the sum of eight powers of z is zero. But unless there's cancellation, they simply cancel in pairs. They're the nth root of unity satisfies an equation, which is the psychotomic equation, which is known. That is many terms in general. So there can't be just eight terms that add up to the zero. For instance, it's called prime order. Uh -huh. The smallest equations, one plus eight up to z if the p minus one is zero. So if p is bigger than nine, it can never happen. Nice. So there, there is a very strong limitation, I think, also in the uh -huh. same covenant. It's, it's completely bounded. Unless, of course, there's some rather trivial cancellation that the cosines all cancel in pairs. I see. So there's some, which would be like a parametric family, you know, x equals t, or you know, some, some of the degenerate case. For instance, you, your identity is a product of two cosines, a product of two other. If it's the same cosines, then of course that's always true. Cosine of a times cosine yeah. of b is always cosine of a times cosine of b. So in that case, you know, it will be true, and there might be jeopardy like that. But I don't think you can get Ah. Um, essentially non-trivial solutions, except for very small numbers. You could classify them all, because you need a sum of eight roots of unity is zero. I see. The fact that four of the exponents are the negatives, the other four doesn't matter, because zero is real, so that's all the matter. So it's just a short statement, it's just a sum of eight powers, no, well, the sum of eight roots, eight roots of unity is zero. Mm -hmm. But there are very, very few solutions of that, because most roots of unity, uh, together with the conjugates, uh, are so in particular, every root of unity that occurs has to have order of the degree of the field should be at most eight, which is a finite number of possible yes. orders. So it's definitely a finite list. Uh, the, Unless it cancels completely and the, the identity is just zero. Yeah, zero I see. After cancellation. So there's a paper of Conway and Jones that will give you all of the solutions to that equation. Oh. It's a paper from the 70s by Conway and Jones. Okay. And I think what I said last yeah, week is basically 10 minutes. It's, it's, it's very, very simple. Okay, I see.
I see. Consideration. So all of the orders in particular are bounded by 20 or something because you need that 5n is less than or equal to okay. 8. So unless it cancels completely at the end, it's just zero equal to zero. I see. In all of the cases. I see. I see. Yeah, but uh, so it, it resembles more or less as the, the list produced by, by Cox, at a, where you have infinite families, but then you have basically sporadic. No, the infinite families must be for a very trivial reason, probably the two cosines on the left and on the right are simply the same yes. to reorder. So of course that will always work. Yes. We always have the product of two numbers as the product of the same two numbers. But in all of the cases, I see. we would not get more than five at least. Okay. So it's a small problem. Well, thank you. <laughs> bit, of, bit of number theory showing up. Yeah, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, let's speak, let's start the speaker again.